Good morning. Uh, you may have noticed I am not Catherine Peters. I'm here because we decided not to make Catherine moderate every panel at today's event. Um, uh, but thank you all again for being here. Um, in our previous panels, we've heard a lot about big changes underway in government from reskilling to upskilling to retraining to automating work and implementing AI. To either drive those changes or adjust to them may require some change in government culture. So we're kind of getting down to where things really happen now. Um, so I'd like to explore, we'd like to explore in this panel, sort of three main themes. What exactly is the culture issue in government? What needs to change? And what specifically do we need to do to change it? So let's start with that first one for each of you. What exactly is the culture issue that we need to address? I get the pleasure of being on the end. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Brittany Sickler with the Small Business Administration. Uh, like many of you in the, in the crowd, I imagine we've uh, been at different parts or in different offices in our, our agencies or perhaps multiple agencies and see many issues with culture over the time. And I know we only have half an hour, so I, I won't go into all the, the crazy stories. But uh, I think one thing that we don't often recognize is how culture is part of everything uh, that's going on. It's not an additional layer to our challenges. It's not kind of that extra thing, oh, here's our mission, here's our vision. And then there's a feeling of, of culture. Uh, especially at, at SBA, we're working with entrepreneurs, businesses of many kinds around the country, and there's a, a language that sometimes tries to compare the work we're doing to the work that a potential business is doing. And so I'll hear culture talked about as if, uh, you know, we're not quite meeting what a startup might be doing. And uh, there's some danger there. Uh, the issue is that uh, our, our culture is uh, kind of behind the processes, it's the people, and our government context is different than obviously the, the startup context. And so I definitely want to make sure we can kind of delve into a little bit of um, having a language around culture that actually helps us explore some of those issues. Uh, well, at USDA, I think one of the issues that we see is, uh, is one, there is a lot of excitement. So, uh, you know, Understanding what opportunities are out there is still something people are are looking at and maybe uh, trying to understand better. But uh, just attended a session uh, yesterday where uh, many of our executives in one of our 19 agencies were actually uh, looking at the opportunities for how they can leverage analytics uh, at the employee level to provide them with intelligence about how they can better manage their portfolio. Uh, USDA is, uh, has one of our agencies; it's uh, Rural Development, it's one of the six largest lenders in the United States. So. There's a lot of excitement about uh, the opportunities that are out there. I think one of the other uh, challenges we have is uh, having a clear line of sight between the daily activities of what all employees do and the end product that's provided to customers. I think, I think there's some work to do there, and also the interconnected nature of the work that everyone's engaged in. So how does uh, this larger indicator or KPI relate to uh, how, what the person down the hall is doing for me and how can I help them get that work done. So I think that's where we have a lot of opportunity in the culture is to actually take that excitement that's out there, uh, educate people about the uh, opportunities for the future, uh, prepare them for change, uh, but also uh, better communicate and, uh, and think critically about what are the things that we're measuring uh, to, to produce the outcomes that we're all, we're all after. And I'd agree with what both my colleagues have said. I certainly think there's a lot of opportunity for change, but one of the things when, and I'm a big fan, I'll put that out there, of needing to look at culture, needing to look at people, but one of my questions has always been, well, what culture are we talking about? I don't think we have a common definition of what that culture is that we're trying to go to. I think we all say, hey, we're looking towards the future, we're looking towards these new innovative practices, to data, to whatever, but we haven't come up with what is that, are we moving in the same direction, are there different cultures based on different work, and then we've also done things where we've really pushed people to say, it's about the results. Well, no, now it's about innovation. Well, no, now it's about you know data or customer service, all parts of the puzzle, but I don't think we've come up with what is that big picture puzzle we're looking for. And so I think that's some of our challenge with AI, with some of these emerging technologies, is where are we really going? Is there a culture of government? And if so, how would you characterize it? 
I think that's the question out there. I mean, I look at my colleagues, each of your agencies is very different. Um, and so I certainly think part of it is we may be looking at, is it one government culture? Or are we looking at agency cultures? Because it might be different what's needed. Is this a agency that's really cutting edge doing research or a component? I mean, within DHS, you've got different cultures in there, even within small agencies. And so I think that's part of it is identifying and maybe saying it's okay to have different cultures as long as we know what it is we need. I think you. Oh, and I was gonna say, I definitely think there is a public perception of, of government culture. Right. Uh, and I think we could go in this room and, and find some similarities and even differences, but as, uh, as, as you just shared, there, there's a nuance there that we, we shouldn't overlook. And that's something that I don't think many leaders take the time to go through is that process of, what are the beliefs? What what is going on in the culture space? And you know who are the stakeholders involved? So within the agency, outside the agency, how is this influencing uh, that whole realm? I think I think that's a really good point. When you're talking about uh, looking at the the variation across the uh, culture in a large organization, uh, USDA is a good example. Large field presence. We have a lot of folks in headquarters. Obviously. Before you can change a culture, you can drive toward where you want to go, but you also really need to understand where you are and, and also the reasons that drive it, right? And really understand, again, as you said, the stakeholders that are maybe driving that culture, uh, both external and internal. So I think that's really critical. One aspect of government culture that tends to be publicly perceived is risk aversion. So let's talk about that a little bit. Have you seen this in your experience in government and working with agencies? Um, and what, what's the big issue there and how do we address it? Well, I'll jump out and say we've all heard risk aversion, but I've also seen some really innovative, cutting edge things happen in government. I don't think it's a secret, and we heard folks talking about it up here earlier, about where things are happening, where they're trying something different. And I've talked to a number of people who have done this time after time, it's not new. However, the federal government is under a microscope in some respects. We do work of the country. People are watching Congress, the media, you've got IGs. I think there's that perception that doing things might put you in a bad place, which you know dampens the risk taking. But I also question, and I, I wonder where you all come down on this, is I don't think every job has to be a risk. Sometimes it's just doing your job differently, doing it better, finding new processes, new um, folks to bring to the table leveraging new business models. So I think maybe some of it too, in my perspective, is changing the language. We're not asking people to take risks. We're asking them to work in a more strategic way and think about what they're working on. What I would say is I think, I think looking at the changing environment helps us understand uh, how we need to deal with this, this topic of risk. Uh, we look at uh, the kinds of work that's gonna be automated, uh, the kinds of work that's, that we expect to be augmented uh, as we look ahead. Uh, you know, one of the, obviously we're going to need, uh, there's going to be increased demand for, for technical data, data skills in the future, for sure. But I think even more critical, if you look at uh, the landscape, is uh, those core competencies that have been true uh, in the past, I think, are going to be even more important. Uh, so that I think when we come to talk about empathy, when we talk about customer service, and we talk about uh, leadership, I think those are the, those are the key uh, skill sets that are needed. And I think how we, what we look, look at is not just the end product that we're building, but a culture of uh, enabling people to take risks uh, uh, that, are, that are controlled, uh, enabling people to actually fail. I think uh, in my personal uh, career, there's been nothing more beneficial than having a leader uh, who gave me the opportunity or gave me a project that they knew I didn't know how to solve when they gave it to me. Uh, and, and also knowing that along the way I would have to fail to be able to figure out how to, how to succeed in the end. So whether that's uh, through uh, uh, you know, giving people, and again, uh, if you're talking about customer service or you're talking about empathy, uh, I, I, would, I would say that you know, there's different ways we can talk about risk, but it really does take a risk-taking attitude to be able to go out and actually try to figure out what someone's thinking at the other end of the table, to actually bring them a product uh, on the first day that you know isn't going to satisfy them, but having the courage to be able to take the feedback and go and make it better. So I think the, as, we, as we shape our teams and we work with them on a daily basis, I think uh, those are the things that managers and cultures and, and organizations need to be thinking about is how do we actually prepare people to do those things on a daily basis. I think we're already witnessing more culture change than we uh, realize. I don't know if I ever thought we'd get to the day where we're talking about empathy in such a normal way in government, so I, I appreciate that. 
Uh, back to risk, uh, another point I wanted to bring up on the risk spectrum is, you know, we, we go on this conversation of, so the government might be risk averse, our agencies, our teams, our, our programs might be risk averse, and, you know, we need to take more risks. On the other hand, we're, as the government, we're not structured to, to take those risks, uh, not when we're employing taxpayer dollars and putting forth programs that are legislated. So there can be an extreme to the conversation that's not helpful for us to actually dig down and say, all right, well, when we're going through risk, are we actually you know, talking about uh, just a, a fear of change or of looking at things from a different perspective? And can we actually go through and say, oh, this, is, this might be a, a tradition. This might just be something that's been handed down. There's not necessarily a, a process or a reason behind it. And you know, we're just kind of afraid to explore that. And so I think having enough of a, kind of a, an openness, both on leadership and from below, to really analyze and, and go through, you know, how are we doing things? Why are we doing that? I mean, it, it kind of goes to that basic element of, of that trust. And I think you've both hit on something that has been on my mind a lot, is not everybody, and backwards for a minute, I had a colleague when I was in uh, the government who was really big on assessments things like strengths finders, the BP-10, things like that that helped you see things like, you know, customer service focus, empathy, things like that. Well, the BP-10, one of the things we did, I was running a fellowship program at the time, we put them through this. What it does is tell you, um, supposedly, and I'm not an uh, IO psychologist or anybody to, to say whether this is true or not, but what is your capacity to take risk, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative? Not everybody has the same levels of skills. It doesn't make it right or wrong that you can do it, but part of it is looking at being strategic. What does the job need? Does it need somebody who can take risks? Have we found out who those people are? And put them in those jobs and identified that. So I think part of risk taking too is figuring out do we have the right people in those areas on the team, like you said. So. Ted, I wanted to ask you, you have military service in your background in addition to working in civilian government. Have you noticed cultural differences between those two organizations? If so, what are they? I, I think, of course, there's some, there's some cultural differences. I, I would actually point to a, a continuity in terms of what the, what the needs are for an organization, whether that's the military, whether that's the federal sector. Uh, we're all in public service. Uh, so the needs may be different in certain cases. Uh, Talk, and I, I serve the Navy, so uh, you know, honor, honor, courage, commitment. And actually, in our leadership team, uh, we we actually found by chance that all four of us had served in the military. So we, we do share some some common background in terms of our experiences, and we, we find it's valuable. But we've had to adjust in in the federal culture, uh, you know, a little bit in terms of how we engage and how we operate. Uh, but I think uh, we talk about USDA as an example. Uh, you know, our principles of of doing right and feeding everyone and uh, moving toward a fact-based, data-driven, customer-focused organization, I think having the principles and understanding where the organization is going is where I think uh, those opportunities lie. And, I, and uh, when it comes to um, sort of harnessing that, whether that's in the, in the military or, uh, or in the federal side, I think uh, one of the great opportunities we have today with, with data, uh, putting my chief data officer hat for, for a moment, is, is really creating visibility in the downstream effects of the, of the daily tasks that people are engaged in. Because a lot of times they actually uh, it's difficult for them to see how the work that they do impacts people far downstream. So uh, uh, one example would be how are people using USDA's data to provide decision to support to, to farmers to actually improve uh, the, uh, the, the level of skill that's being implemented on farms and the, and the level of, uh, of knowledge they have to be able to operate on those farms and kind of uh, elevating uh, and, and um, more rapidly providing them with that intelligence. You know, at USDA, our data is pulled from nine different agencies to, to, to a private company that could not provide that intelligence uh, to, to farmers without that data. And I think if people understand that and we can communicate that better, I think knowing the value of what you do helps you to, whether it's, whether it's taking risks or whether it's just uh, making sure that you're working across lines to, to actually get the job done and the mission accomplished, I think that's where, where that continuity still exists. I want to circle back to an issue that Jenny raised, and that's that's oversight, and I'll quote Bill, Pl Bill Pratt from the previous session in saying, Congress is after us 24-7. Uh, and there's also IGs and <clears throat> the, the media uh, and various other groups that are constantly looking over what, what federal employees and managers are doing. 
Um, and my question is, are they going to drive risk aversion no matter what leaders in government do? I would actually uh, disagree with that, uh, just on the, the basis of, uh, you know, if, if we're having our, our programs, our work closely looked at as is appropriate, and, and I do, you know, appreciate that, we need to be striving towards accountability, uh, that almost should push us to looking at new ways to solve the problems versus kind of bunkering down and being afraid to take risks. So if you kind of take a perspective shift in that sense, you know, in the modern era, there's no time to, to sit back and wait for things to play out. We need to be fully engaged. I also think, too, part of it is understanding um, what role the media plays in things, what role Congress plays, where they're coming from. And one of the things I found, oftentimes, a lot of people don't have experience working with other branches, or whether it's with media, whether it's with Congress, whether it's GAO and the IG. And so when you hear about them, you might think, hey, they're coming after me. But I think if you understand what their role is, what they're looking for, how to appropriately communicate, what is the work we're doing, why are we doing it, how are we doing it, and have that strategy, it actually can be both a partnership, there's transparency, there's the ability to have feedback and oversight, and you know, there is a strategy behind working with all these groups and working with them together. But again, that goes back to line of sight, understanding, what the roles are and what the mission is. And so I think part of this is about training, giving people understanding and ability to really know who these different players are. Uh, those, are those are great comments. I, the only thing I would add to that is I would say, uh, my experience has been that that, that that role is appropriate. And um, I think what we could use help from the media on is actually ratcheting up, uh, not down, the expectations on government. When we're talking about the opportunities for machine learning, uh, we need to actually lift our expectations of what government is and should be capable of doing uh, and driving the conversation around managing the risk to get there, right? So uh, it's, a, it's, it's essential that we look at risks and we think about risk and that we manage them appropriately. Um, but I think uh, by forcing that conversation of saying, no, we are going to continue to raise the standards, uh, that helps us to have the conversations at the appropriate level, not to be risk averse, but just to manage it appropriately. As an editor, I can say that my experience is agencies really love it when we push to set the standards higher. Um, along with risk and risk taking comes, ought to come rewards. And I'm interested in your perspective on that, that aspect of the issue. How do we, what are ways we can change the reward culture in government so that innovation and risk taking uh, and that ability to keep moving forward actually gets recognized and rewarded? Well, I think it's part of what you brought up earlier, which is allowing people to fail, just not slapping people on the hand, if that's the case, you know, for failure, um, uh, encouraging risk. And some of this comes back to leadership. And I think the rewards could be anything from retooling. I think I heard somebody use the term on the last panel, making sure your employees get the training and the development they need, making sure they have the tools in their toolkit to take the risk. Some of it is less when I think reward monetary. I don't think that's what we're talking about here per se, or at least in my mind. Some of it is just giving people the freedom and the space without saying no to go out and pilot something. I love doing pilots because in the government, that's one way to go about innovation with maybe a low sort of failure, low you know, tolerance for um, failure and whatnot. And so, so finding those opportunities and just even allowing people is in some respects the reward to say, hey, you have a great idea, let's go try it. Uh, I would say also you know, on the same theme of reward is uh, looking at how we're able to talk about the, the outcomes and who we're affecting. There's uh, many agencies or missions are the, the people who work there closely align with the mission, whether they're in an office that directly impacts someone, uh, a citizen, or uh, they're a little bit farther removed, but they're still part of that system that is making a positive change. And so when we're looking at, at the rewards, we're looking at are we increasing our efficiency? Is our program serving more people? Are we you know, better able to achieve all of these things that have been set out, even if the expectations are high. And I think that's something that doesn't get looked at enough these days. And uh, sometimes I'll hear discussions on uh, some generational differences about uh, you know, looking at 
you know, who, who feels satisfied with their work and why and, and how that is. Uh, another part is that storytelling, and, and not storytelling in a negative way, but really being able to articulate what's taking place and, and how and why, and everything from the data, from the budget, uh, all the way down to the, the story of, in, in, in my case, the entrepreneurs that I'm working with. And there is a, a big chasm uh, between that. Uh, I often find I, I speak in a few languages. I have my language uh, at work. I have my language when I'm out working with our partners, our support organizations. Uh, and then there's a few in between. I think one, one other uh, thing to add to that is to say, and I think really good points. I actually don't, I think I would have said something very similar. So what I would just say is, um, uh, one opportunity that organizations have, and again, it's, it's not on the media for just to, for them to talk about raising expectations. We need to do that internally. And so I think uh, one of the things that we should do internally uh, that shows value and gives, gets employees engaged is actually to set some really big, hairy, audacious goals, right? So uh, when our secretary went and actually had the centers of excellence uh, from GSA come and, and embed themselves with us as we engage on IT modernization across a number of fronts, uh, that led to real conversations about how are we going to how are we going to manage performers that are not doing what they need to do? How do we help them to actually see what they can do differently? Uh, and how do we incentivize uh, you know good performers? But how do we just provide visibility into the benefit that you're providing? Right when you come to work every day and you know the value you're delivering and uh, you don't have to live with uh, with a sense of mediocrity. I think uh, that is one of the best incentives you can give anybody. And so no one here up here talked about pay. Uh, we could have talked about that. It's not like it's not an incentive, but I think uh, what, you, what you hear up here is a, a conversation about giving people meaningful work. And I think recognizing meaningful work right. and yeah. not, again, not monetary, but sometimes the easiest way is to, for especially senior leadership, if you've set a you know, big, hairy, audacious goal, to go and say thank you. If your employees have actually done the work or tried to do the work and maybe they failed for you know a number of reasons, it's not about the failure, it's about what steps did they take to move the needle forward and go thank them and recognize it. I mean that at the end of the day is easy and it costs no money. And I think it you know helps continue making people see their line to the mission and be excited about doing it again. That's a great point. Our first panel today talked about reskilling and that tends to be discussed in more sort of technical terms, like the new effort to train people to do for cybersecurity jobs, that sort of thing. Do we need management and leadership reskilling in government? I don't know if my bosses are watching. <laughs> Uh, no, I think we all can agree to, to say yes to some extent. There's always that room for improvement. Otherwise, you know, what would we be talking about here today? Uh, and so there, there's the kind of the constant need to look at uh, what are the, the skills that we expect of our leaders, how are we uh, getting those skills even as people are progressing. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up was a, a program I was recently part of, the 21st Century Government Leaders Program, just piloted through uh, the, it was with the Partnership for Public Service, but also with the American Institutes for Research and the Policy Design Lab. And the whole, the whole goal was to look at uh, kind of the uh, mid government uh, uh, managers and leaders. How can we, within the context that they're working, kind of have the skills uh, and the ability to, to navigate uh, different situations? So uh, we went through this program and it was uh, fascinating. We had the government context, here's our constraints, limitations, our opportunities. Uh, and then also here are some practical ways that we can work uh, to get to those impacts. And so I think there is more of an openness and, and maybe we're somewhat in, in some bubbles here, but there is an openness to say, you know, not every uh, manager or leader in government has the perfect skill set. I, I think one of the just broad statements to make is that it's not just about government too. I think this is just a global phenomenon uh, when we talk about leadership competencies are going to have to change, right? And, and so it's not about looking back at the past or the president saying, uh, you know, we've done something wrong, it's just the world is changing and we need to be able to deal with it appropriately. Uh, so uh, I'll give an example from USDA where we actually uh, provided a lot more data to our leaders this year uh, through a set of dashboards that are, that are available to all of our leaders across 19 agencies. And it would be unfair to expect me or anybody in the department of 100,000 people to actually know all the things that we should be able to do with the data that we have. I think we just need to actually think, uh, to realize that we have work to do. Uh, that there are opportunities that are out there and we need to research uh, and really be thinking about how technologies can implement and how we actually uh, work with machine learning and how we work with employees and how we lead change in a different way. And those skills are, those skills are just going to change and continue to change. And I just think we need to be on top of them, whether we're in the 
public sector or whether we're in the private sector. And one of the things I've been thinking through a lot with some of the folks I've been working with um, on leadership issues is really there are some cross-cutting leadership skills. I mean, but I think one of the things where we sometimes get into a little bit of a bind is that we say all leaders must have X skill. Well, a leader in one place may not need the same skills as a leader in a different job. Part of the challenge is we haven't looked at jobs and said, well, what are the skills that particular job requires? There might be a reorganization at an agency. That leader leading that might need a higher level of risk tolerance. They might be better communicators and collaborators, whereas another program someplace else that's really technical may need a different type of leader who's really the sort of um, strategic thinking, research-oriented leader. And so part of this is actually really taking a step back from the job and the mission and looking, flipping it on its head and saying, yes, we need mission and outcome and results for the American public, but the people are the ones who get us to those missions. So what are the people, what are the skills we need in each of those jobs, how do we find the people who have those skills, and then how do we put them in the jobs? And it's, it's hard, it's not easy, and it's gonna take a rethinking of how we actually look at leadership and the skills that we require. I want to ask about this issue of generational differences. As the oldest person up here by far, I will ask uh, this this way. Um, are you coming to rescue us? And if not you, is, are the millennials and Gen Z, are they going to? Uh, I hate to disappoint you, Tom. Uh, I, I don't think I can rescue uh, everything I don't, and on behalf of all of us. Uh, one, one very difficult issue, if I can start not on the negative side, but is confronting that, where even in the, the offices I've been part of, I'll see uh, newer, uh, kind of younger individuals joining, and that expectation that if if it's not you know their perspective or energy that's going to help, it's their knowledge of some kind of technology or, or innovative tool that's going to fix things. And the the interesting thing is, I think you know most of us have been in our careers long enough to know that there's not that you know, magic uh, dart or, or arrow that's that's going to, to fix things. And so uh, maybe it's a, a comforting thought, but uh, one thing I, I do believe strongly is that it, it's not the, the technology, the innovation, the tool that's gonna fix things because as was said before, it's the people behind it. So how is that being implemented? What's its uh, purpose? What, you know, what information are we measuring? How are we executing what we're working on? Uh, that's what's key, and so the, the generation piece to it, uh, I think the, that sometimes can, can uh, let people down, I would say, right away. I, th I think I, it may be a little, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I have also would say the people who are in agencies are the ones we should be focused on. They're doing the work. It's not the people who aren't yet in the door, and we don't know if they're coming in the door. You know, I, people come in and out all the time, and so I think one of the things I'd like to see more is actual focus of not saying, you know, somebody n new is gonna, who has different skill sets, different others is gonna save us. It's that we actually do all have the capacity to think through, and there are some phenomenal people in the government. By and large, most federal workers I know are incredibly talented. And so, you know, I think the, the thing is, and it doesn't matter age, generation, whatever, it's giving people the tools and the empowerment to do their jobs. And so I'd like to say, let's focus on the people in the in the roles before we start th waiting for somebody else or something else to come change it. I, I just find the, the distinction, you know, less helpful than helpful, right? So I think um, uh, when we confront people on our teams, we're looking at their competencies, we're interviewing people, or we're meeting new people in meetings, you know, just realizing you don't know who you're sitting across the table from, uh, people often surprise you, and uh, generation, uh, you know, it's, I think it's just something that maybe divides us more than brings us together. So I, uh, Sorry to disappoint too as well, but yeah. I do have one more well, comment, Tom, if I can jump in. My first uh, uh, position at the SBA was in a district office out in Fargo, North Dakota, and I was the first person that the office, very small, had uh, brought in in almost 20 years. And so I was about 30 and uh, just starting with the federal government and working with colleagues that had been there 30 years. And uh, the fascinating thing going through that is from the outside, I had friends saying that that must be such a challenge, you know, the, the differences, uh, you're gonna burn out, it, it's not gonna last, but uh, you know, it was not the case. And the, the colleagues I had were fantastic. And we almost, uh, I hate to use the word exploit, but we, we used each other in a sense. They wanted to hear from me what I knew from outside, 
uh, from the experiences I had had, uh, the relationships, the networks I was bringing in. And from them, I wanted to know how I could get my work done, the things done, in a way where, okay, I have this idea, but how can I work within SBA's rules? How can I work within our government structure to do that? And we had this phenomenal way. We, we even went through human-centered design, design thinking work together, and brought that to headquarters, which, uh, you know, when I did come to D.C., most people said, oh, you're from North Dakota, this must be a shock. But I said, actually, it's a shock that some of these things aren't taking place already in uh, uh, an urban or larger area. And I think that's all one final thing. A great yeah. point is the team. I mean, part of this is about, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about individual performance or organizational performance, especially with, I think, AI and with the way things are changing and the um, pace at which we're expected to deliver on mission to the American public. You need to think about your team. Maybe you need somebody with a different perspective, different, and you know, somebody who's been there for 20 years, somebody who's your technician, somebody who's your great data scientist or whatever, start thinking about, and that's a different way than we've think, thought about performance, is really putting it on the team focus and saying, not one is good or one is bad, we probably need a little of all of it in order to get the job done. I think we have time for a question or two. The mic is coming. Good morning. How are you creating a culture of learning to drive the changes within your organization? At least uh, at the SBA, I've definitely seen a shift over the last few years of the agency supporting many different ways uh, to, uh, to again, fit in the learning track. So there's uh, some of the established programs or classes that have gone on for a while, but the one I mentioned recently was when our, our office supported uh, my attendance. So there's some new kinds of ways, new organizations that are, are putting forth curriculum to address issues. Uh, we also have a very strong kind of peer-to-peer -peer network in the agency. So how are we learning from each other and kind of being comfortable with sessions being taught uh, you know, amongst from, from below. You don't have to have a certain grade level to provide uh, your uh, perspective, your expertise. And uh, I think we've, we've definitely seen at SBA kind of a shift in how we view learning, how we view each other uh, in that sense, and it doesn't and shouldn't all be a formal top-down. We, we talk about it as a, as, a, as a process, as a journey. We talk about our data journey, right? So uh, I think that just, that, that narrative, right, that storytelling aspect kind of lets people know that one, the expectation is we're all going to continue to learn together and we're on a path together uh, and we're all part of this journey. Uh, and um, that's, a, that's, I think, the first starting point. Uh, and then just having a communities, uh, communities of practice where uh, we can talk about how to create a data-driven culture, we exchange best practices, we elevate people who are doing really great work, we make them into to data heroes. So we're going to be standing up some communities of practice this year, I think, that are going to be really critical to pe helping people see uh, that many people who were doing, work, were doing different work a couple years ago are now doing something different uh, and, have, and they have the same opportunity to be able to, to learn something new, whether that's uh, whether that's data visualization or more advanced analytics, modeling, those kinds of things. So really exciting, and I think uh, once you show people what they can do, uh, they'll, they'll go after it. And I think, too, some of it, at least that I saw in the, my former agency, is some of it is individually driven, right? You have some folks who really put a premium on learning, development, rotations, things like that. And so finding, creating microcultures. If you have a supervisor who's really open to that, Again, recognizing and letting them do that, but I think part of it is encouraging from the leadership level down individual supervisors to support their staff in a growth mindset, in training and development, in seeking out their opportunities, knowing that it's not only good for your current work, but good for both your employees and the government as a whole. So part of it is just identifying and um, finding those opportunities for people. And of course, everybody's got lots of training money laying around, so <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Eric. I represent Florida International University, and so I guess I'll be self-serving and ask, is there any way that higher education can support what you're looking to do? We've heard a lot about kind of internal to the agencies, and can we do something to uh, get the uh, newer entrance to your agencies the way uh, in this culture fit from when we're educating them? 
I've seen some really good partnerships across government uh, with universities and with agencies, some are agency specific, OPM has one where different um, universities are, I guess, give credit or whatnot to federal employees, and so I certainly think that's part of it, but I'll go back to something you said earlier about um, needing to know what those skills are that people need broadly. It's not just in the government, but in, uh, across businesses, across, uh, you know, across globally, what are those skill sets? What are the ways of thinking? What are the ways of uh, looking at work? And so I think part of it is figuring out at the university level what those skills are, what courses are available. And a lot of what I've found, honestly, there are so many good things out there and good classes, people just don't know about them. And so a large part of it is just communicating, you know, trainings that are out there, opportunities that different employees can make use of. Uh, just something that comes to mind would be, uh, one is uh, how, how are the university system going to support continual learning, right? So just thinking about the model for that, um, people who are who are working who need to get, and I th there's a lot of different things that are merging uh, to, to handle that, but I think just continuing to think about that. Uh, the the second thing I would say is um, maybe maybe just, uh, and, and again, I know there, there are universities who are doing this already, but, but just thinking beyond the sort of the you know, t technical implementation for, on the technology side, right? So how does, emotional intelligence and design thinking support that? What does it actually look like in the workplace as opposed to in the classroom? I think uh, maybe even bringing in uh, private sector or, or having those those internships be brought in as part of the classroom activities I think is one of the one of the things I would recommend because I think translating it between the two is in that dialogue is really important. I think the last thing I'll say uh, in a more general sense, uh, having uh, the ability for folks at the university, whether it's on the faculty side, student side, uh, have engagements with uh, government in a general sense and, and vice versa. Uh, I think when we're, we're talking about innovation, we're always talking about the fact that ideas aren't coming from very siloed areas. It's from people who have overlaid networks and are being confronted with different ideas. So the more we can continue to provide spaces, whether it's uh, you know virtual physical space or as we're talking about AI in the future, other ways that we can collide and connect and communicate, I think that's where we're gonna see um, some of the biggest uh, impacts emerge. And I think, too, finding internships, ways to encourage folks coming out of universities and schools, a lot of them aren't necessarily looking at federal government as a career. And so I think helping, there's some really great training opportunities to get in training and come in and for agencies to learn from students, too. So I think looking for areas to find that pipeline is a good thing. Well, I think we could go on all day with this discussion, but we're at time. So please join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion.